Hello, I'm Francis Terry and I'm a classical architect and I specialise in designing country houses. And today I'm with Martin Lier, who's an environmental planner, and we are going to be discussing paragraph 80. And Martin, if you could just um, maybe describe what you do and a little bit about what paragraph 80 is. Yes, um, under the National Planning Policy Framework, NPPF, um, paragraph 80 supersedes the previous paragraphs of earlier versions. Originally, this legislation came under Para 55, then Para 79E, now Para 80. But it all started back in 1997 under what some call the Gumma Law, where um, essentially new houses in the countryside are not allowed under policy unless needed for agriculture or forestry or other purposes, but so as not to lose the great tradition of the new English country house, Gummer persuaded uh, the government to introduce the legislation then, which was to allow for large new country houses as an exception. Yeah, looking at the sort of history of the country house, I think Gummer was very conscious that this has been going on really since Tudor times that um, England has a kind of global significance for producing country houses. If you think of the uh, novels of Jane Austen or Evelyn War, there's a real alert to the country house. And he really saw it as his role in, pro in producing the exception clause, which now is NPPF paragraph 80, uh, to make a, a way of continuing this tradition into our time. Yeah. And uh, my role in all of this, having trained as a chartered surveyor and landscape architect and worked for the Countryside Commission on Heritage Management Plans at places like Chatsworth and Highclere, my role is to initially appraise a site and its suitability for a new country house. And we'll come on to the, the criteria for that. And then working with great architects and other professionals to draw together what's needed and to make sure that we give the client good advice step by step as to the likelihood of success and the time scales required and the work that will be needed. We've done this a number of times together yeah. and you've identified five key uh, tests yep. to um, ensure that a house is exceptional. If we could just go through those one by one. Yep. I think what I'll do first is just summarise the five and then yes. we can talk about okay. each individually. Yep. So. The five key tests allow for a new isolated house in the countryside, and we'll talk about what constitutes isolated in a little while. And these five tests are firstly, the design has to be of exceptional quality. Secondly, it has to be truly outstanding, reflecting the highest standards in architecture. Um, previously, it could be truly outstanding or innovative, but that option isn't there anymore. It just has to be truly outstanding. Thirdly, it has to help raise standards of design more generally in rural areas, in other words, to be an exemplar. Fourthly, the project has to deliver significant enhancement of the immediate setting, so that's the landscape, the habitat. And lastly, it has to be sensitive to the defining characteristics of the area. So those are the five yeah. key tests. Well, if we start with the first one, um, design of exceptional quality, and we've done this a number of times, and this comes down to the quality of the brickwork, the materials. Is there anything else that the, the planners are really looking for when they see that term exceptional yes. quality? I think the, you, you, you can design a truly exceptional house in isolation. So you could just have beautiful elevations and floor plans and you would look at the design and say, that's wonderful, but it has to fit on the site. So a house of exceptional quality that is also truly outstanding has to fit and be right for the site. Yes. So the composition, the scale, the beauty, and I think you've used the, the, the test for your own, it has to look as if it's always been, yeah yeah absolutely that it so that it, it doesn't look like a kind of intrusion on the landscape like a sort of uh, factory or something sure. it's got to look like it's it, it's always been there yeah. it's interesting um the i mean that leads very naturally on to truly outstanding because you could make a building that is has the best brickwork the best joinery but it's, it isn't truly outstanding. And I'm just interested to sort of unpick what you feel are the things that 
go f making something from exceptional quality into truly outstanding? What, what is the... Well, I think the move, uh, the design has to be truly outstanding and of exceptional quality, but then the truly outstanding requirement specifically is how it will then be built, the craftsmanship, yes. the quality of the stone, of the, the detailing, um, the, the overall composition, you know, all of how it will be done. And, and it's not just that it has to be very good, it has to be truly outstanding. So mm. it has to be the very, very best that you yes. can deliver. I, I mean, that goes beyond the craftsmanship. That yes. will be the proportions, how it sits in the land, you know, if it's a sloping site, uh, how you've catered for that level in, in a way that that seems natural um, and is beyond the ordinary, yes. that, that isn't just sort of the everyday. I think you're right. I think the composition and how it sits, so the house doesn't exist in isolation, it sits within a setting and, and it has to feel right. Yes, I and mean, we often talk about my work being uh, classical with a twist, mm -hmm. so it isn't a matter of just simply copying classical buildings of the past. It's looking at the site, the brief, the context, the materials, and doing something that is of that place, of our time. Yes. And that's, I feel, the sort of thing they're looking for, 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 for going above and beyond yes. the ordinary. Yes, and I think we had a good example working together in Wiltshire, where we were on a, a very wide open, plain landscape, downland landscape, mm. huge, huge, visual envelope and we replaced some ugly farm buildings and then the design you had a very beautiful classical center part of the site mm. and then two wings opened up um, and almost embraced the landscape and they responded to that very wide setting yes. and those wings were designed not purely classic no sure, um, sure and i think that it's got to be something I mean, a lot of people you bandy the word pastiche, but you don't just replicate an 18th century design. Yes. I mean, um, neither do people really want exactly no, an 18th century no. design. They want a, a house that caters for modern life and so on. And that, I feel, is contributes into the progression of the English country house in the same way that a Tudor house had different requirements from a Georgian house. Yeah. And we're all part of that ongoing sort of living tradition. I, I think another thing on the truly outstanding, which is of a growing issue, is sustainability. We've both found that um, planners are really looking at uh, the the, car the embodied carbon of the build, uh, the, the, how it will be heated, the insulation. This is going to be a growing issue. Yeah. yeah, no, we've certainly found that over just the last three or four years. Previously, we would say, our, the energy efficiency of our house, the sustainability, we can improve on building regs by 10 or 20 percent mm. and that seemed to be good enough. Mm. Whereas now, you know, people are looking at achieving carbon neutral houses, the use of the materials, uh, the, the sources of energy and, and it, within a wider landscape, the reinstatement of lost woodland, um, grassland, other features can all help to deliver that high quality package of sustainable development and that you know as as we are finding with cop 26 the mm. call for us all to be more sustainable in our living i think will grow and grow and so for instance we we've you've designed a house using cross laminated timber yeah, absolutely rather yes. than so much steel and concrete which environmentally is far far better yeah although yeah. we do know that stone is a sustainable material because if you can... Well, it's just, it comes from the ground. It comes from the yeah, ground, exactly. and it is recyclable. Yeah, yeah. So, well, these sort of arguments, which we've had, always had in our rationales for our designs, are a growing thing. The recyclability, as yeah. you mentioned, are all, are all a big um, issue. Yes. And, I mean, this, in a way, takes us to the, to the next part of... Um, your categories, which is to raise the standards of di design more generally in rural areas. I, I mean, really, if you do an excellent building, it will be talked about, yes. it will be seen. Uh, I mean, it is a kind of consequence, I'd say. It is. I think it, it's going to be an exemplar. So interest in that house, it will be written up in publications. If you're using traditional skills and traditional craftsmanship, which are often only used for repair of buildings. Mm. You're showing how that can still be applied in a, in a new house. 
Um, there have been projects where a website has been set up to show the process of, of the construction that can be seen by others. Um, there can be visits by professional bodies. I mean, will a, um, an owner of a paragraph 80 house be obliged to do these no, things? No, not at all. Um, there's no requirement to open to the public or have visits. Mm. But I think where you show that the process of construction will be recorded and will be available as an exemplar, mm. I think that's the sort of expectation that it will be a model that can then be applied, maybe on a different scale, yeah. maybe in different ways, maybe with different techniques, but mm. the way in which you designed using cross-laminated timber, that could still be used on a smaller scheme. And things like flint work is, is a sort of a dying trade. Mm. And um, I think people like the um, National Trust and Historic England are yeah. all very keen uh, that these new houses should be uh, should use these crafts yep. so that there's something exciting for yeah. these um, young people coming yes. up to um, get their teeth into. Yes. And I think from the origins of classical architecture, the use of materials has, you know, and, and the way in which classical houses are built has stood the test of time. And although now the designs will progress and, and suit modern day living, and you've talked about um, classical with a twist, um, it is ensuring that those skills aren't lost yeah. because there's yeah, an outlet absolutely. for them. Yeah, yes. Well, I think if we come to the um, next, which is point, which is a very important one, which you, you raised, um, significant enhancement to the, of the immediate, immediate setting. setting. Yes. So we, we, I, we've had a, some successes in Norfolk. And yes. I remember South Norfolk Council telling us that of the seven cases they had refused, six were refused because they failed to deliver significant enhancement of the immediate setting. So in other words, it wasn't all about the architecture. It's mm. whether the land around the house, which might only be two or three acres, but often it will be more, 50 acres, um, you're delivering significant enhancement. So we, our starting point on this is we look to see what's happened to that landscape, not just the site, but the wider landscape for a few miles away. What's happened over the last 200 years? Has the quantity of woodland gone down? Have hedges been removed? Mm -hmm. Has species-rich grassland been ploughed out for arable cultivation? Have farm ponds been lost? Have, have orchards disappeared? So we will look at what were the components of that landscape and where there's a deficit, we, re we reinstate those and create new. So it's not just about landscape features, it's about habitat, biodiversity, um, wetland habitats are very good for a whole range of species. So we look at the potential mm. and then we, we look at delivering through a combined landscape and ecology management plan. I mean, I suppose this is another um, test, is that if you, if you look at a landscape and it looks so perfect and unspoiled and there's lots of beautiful hedgerow that's been there for hundreds of years, mm. it's going to be a much more of an uphill struggle than uh, an old derelict, uh, say, farm or possibly a um, light industrial unit yes. where there's lots of concrete. Yes. And when you can say, right, we'll get rid of this concrete, we'll replace, we'll replace this with grassland yeah. or whatever it is. So I, I suppose it's, it is the enhancement, making it, making it better. But that, in a way, it's not to say you can't take um, even farmland mm. that has been uh, in very commercial farming for a long time with lots of pesticides and all of that and say well we can look at this whole area and um, significantly enhance it yeah. and part of that is having a house yes. so it is it isn't I suppose you don't would you, you don't have to have a, a kind of concrete no um, you don't no we've, we've succeeded on greenfield sites but then we've shown that that additional planting and all those landscape measures in combination deliver significant enhancement of the setting. And it's also how we said you can't design a house in isolation. The house has to sit as a composition within the landscape. Yes, and, yes. And that is, is very, very important. And there are sites in this country that I visited and I've said, I don't think you can significantly enhance yeah, it. The site, yeah. the, the landscape is intact, it's well managed, there's a very good representative sample of appropriate habitats. And you can't 
you can't say, oh, I'll create new parkland in a landscape that's downland in character. Yeah. It yeah. has to be appropriate. And that brings us to the fifth yes. and final criterion, which is your proposals have to be sensitive to the defining characteristics of the area. Yes, yes. And for that, again, we don't start with the architecture. So sorry, Mr. Architect. The most important starting point is the landscape setting. And every part of England is, is characterised within a landscape character area. So mm. we can find out what are the key components of the landscape. Um, we can look at a biodiversity action plan for that county. So we can see what types of enhancement will be appropriate to the setting. Yeah. And I'm, that's so important. As well as that, what we often do is I go on a tour with um, someone who knows a lot about historic buildings and we just, and I've done this by myself sometimes, we just drive around the area and look for trends that are, that are happening. This could be, uh, you know, it could be an area where there's lots of flint or um, sometimes it's a stylistic thing where there's a lot of Gothic architecture yes. or it might be a lot of arts and crafts architecture. Um, so it's, it's both materials and also style. And I suppose what, what this um, part of the legislation is about is, uh, given it's so easy to transport materials all over the world, is trying to keep the Cotswolds looking like the Cotswolds with yeah. the Cotswold stone, yeah. trying to make Essex with um, red brick look like um, it, sh you know, it, did, it should or it should do because there's uh, indigenous red brick, other areas are flint areas, and it, it's trying to um, encourage that is, is basically yeah. it. Um, and, and I think that you're right, it, it, there's a lot about the architecture. What's the typical form of roofing? Yes. Um, are, are houses typically defined with courtyards? So if you had a, if typically it was a farmstead area yes. of, of not grand country houses, mm -hmm. which ours doesn't have to be a grand or large country house, then you your form of design would include a courtyard so that you could point to the, the defining characteristics that have inspired yes. your... I, I mean, the other thing is... it. You have to be sensitive to the defining characters of the area, but there are different ways of doing that. I mean, we did do a scheme in Norfolk, as yeah. you well know, where the client was very keen to have a stone building, and Norfolk is primarily br brick and flint. Um, and we did that through looking at the grand houses of the area, and given that this was a grand big house, we felt there was a separate tradition of using stone in Norfolk, which goes right back to medieval times. So you, you, can, you can play on that. You yes. don't actually have to say, right, everything's brick, so we're going with it. You can select your examples. And we were, we were fortunate. In yes, that. I mean, in that, in that particular example, because the client really wanted stone, we were able to show that there has been a tradition that the finer country houses often imported a higher status material, yes, yes. whether it was stone or a roofing material, mm. to emphasise you know, their, their taste or that they could afford to do it. And mm. although the officers resisted us at planning committee, we were successful with unanimous consent yeah. from committee yeah. members. Yeah, but we were very lucky. <laughs> I mean, I think that isn't... Yeah, I mean, that is, wouldn't be my first approach. No, I think no. I would... I normally you must use the materials that are local, even if you use them in a different way. So you reapply techniques in a, in a more modern way. You touched on the issue of the house being isolated. And this obviously goes back to this tradition of the English country house, which, uh, which are independent, isolated buildings. And... There's been a number of, of uh, court rulings on this. Yes. If you could just unpick that yes. for us a bit. Um, yes, in, in recent years, a few councils have challenged proposals by saying they're not isolated. And a, a defining case was with Braintree District Council and the Secretary of State. So both in the High Court, the Court of Appeal and the High Court, there have been rulings on what constitutes isolated. And, and in fact, Lord... Um, Justice Lindblom, with whom I went to school uh, in Surrey, he almost applied a common sense test. It's going to be away from a settlement. It's not going to be right next to other houses. It's probably going to be not well served by public transport, 
but it doesn't have to be remote. So we have had success with projects on the edge of a village, but not within the village and more remotely. And the reason for this is that if, it, if you could do these in a village, you could also get a new house through the replacement dwelling policy mm. because you're part of a settlement. The whole point of this legislation was to allow for country houses that were more isolated or, or separate from settlements in the English country house tradition. Yes. So I think it's, it's not a stumbling block, but it's just something to be aware of and to check out that the location isn't going to be te contested as, as failing to be isolated. Yes. How do we push this forward? What, what's our next thing we do? Well, I think the, we've talked about the starting point being check that your site and the area is capable of enhancement mm. and then select a good architect, if you can find one, yeah. Um, yeah. who will design a house that's sensitive to the defining characteristics. And eventually you will need quite a large team of other professionals, obviously landscape architect, ecologists, perhaps archaeologists, sustainability specialists, potentially to do a flood risk assessment, highways. So that, that's in a sense my job, is looking at each individual case to decide which professionals will be the key players and how do we assemble them. Yeah, and I mean, I, I think on that is um, you would always advise people to go for a replacement dwelling over a paragraph 80 scheme because you, the documentation has to be exceptional, yes. exemplary, and yes. you need to have you need to have all of the uh, I's um, yeah. dotted and T's crossed. Yes. Um, so the, there is quite a large team to go with it, which, make, which makes it I expensive. Mean, a replacement dwelling proposal is exactly that. It's to replace an existing dwelling. Policy is very clear cut about that. It happens all the time. But there are restrictions on the size of the replacement dwelling. Um, and therefore, there's less opportunity. So my advice for having got the right site and got the right architect and landscape architect is to consider a pre-application consultation with the council yes and some people say well that just adds another three to six months and you know what's really gained by it and we wouldn't do that necessarily for a replacement dwelling but i think the the benefit of doing it for nppf para 80 schemes is that one you can review and agree with the council what are the defining characteristics of the area mm. two you can test the water for what measures they will accept as delivering significant enhancement yeah. and then you can talk about the architecture fitting mm. and as for any pre-application consultation the council will give you feedback or with historic england as well in a heritage setting they will give you feedback on what they are concerned about or what they wish to see so when your application goes in you know you're delivering on their expectations yes whereas if you don't do it you run the risk that when mm. they see the application for the first time there'll be points of principle that they just don't like yes I mean, you have to take the planners with you on you the do. journey. And the local right. people, a And the local people, absolutely. And this is where I'm a huge believer in the... It's absolutely paramount to have really good presentation mm. because you may well have a series of reports this thick covering all aspects um, that we talked about, the landscape, the archaeology, the ecology, the sustainability. But at the end of the day... Busy council officers aren't going to read all of that in detail. So on every scheme where we've been mm. successful, we've always produced a folding presentation summary, just six sides of A4. Yes. More illustration than words. And you just tell the story and you set it out. And I remember the one a major house we did together in Wiltshire, uh, the chief planning officer we'd worked with because we'd had contact with him over the Tedworth house for help for heroes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I sent him a copy of this summary with your beautiful drawings and mm. lovely visuals. And he, I said, I thought you'd be interested because this will probably come to committee and the case officers on side. And he rang me up to say, God, I wish every application did this because I can show this to the leader of the council yeah. or the head of the yeah. planning committee. Yeah. In 10 minutes, we can review the scheme. Yeah, I mean, they, they effectively want to know why it is acceptable yeah. and then show simply how it passes those tests. Yeah. And you've obviously got, you know, the huge documentation that shows yeah. every last little bit. But yeah. they, they want to know basically yeah. it satisfies it because of yeah. these things. Yeah. That's how it's done. Yes. And I think it's got to be 
fairly simple to assimilate and it's got to be compelling, which is why I always ask and, and want you to do one of your achingly beautiful watercolours and with other architects as well, if you've got a, a shot of a photo of what's there now and this achingly beautiful watercolour or pencil drawing, mm. I mean, you've sold the case, you've sold yeah. the scheme. Yeah, no, I think, I think it, 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 that I think everyone has an emotional response yes. to buildings yes. and if it's something they yes. feel that that looks beautiful, that will fit in, yeah. that sounds good. So I think my, my job again with that, which we our graphics team, we love producing those documents mm. with all the beautiful drawings and visuals yeah. and we often use drone photographs to assess the site and use a perspective to, to do your drawing. So mm. presentation is, is so important um, and then you, you can have confidence that the council may have a view on the design or have a view on the setting, but you can argue strongly why your case ticks all those five boxes under yeah. the Para 80 criteria. Okay, so should we just um, sum up? Um, you've got the five key, um, key tests which yes. we, we listed so earlier on. The design has to be of exceptional quality. It has to be truly outstanding, reflecting the highest standards in architecture, but no longer is it being innovative uh, an option to, to achieve the truly outstanding criterion. Helping to raise standards of architecture and design more generally in rural areas is, is the third point. Fourthly, significant enhancement of the immediate setting. So make sure your site is capable of that enhancement and then you deliver that through a management plan that is covered by way of a condition or legal agreement. And finally, you demonstrate sensitivity to the defining characteristics of the area, both in architectural and landscape terms. Yeah, you have to look at the potential site suitability uh, for enhancement. That is yeah. obviously key, That's sort of day one point. Yeah. starting point. Absolutely. Um, and I. Um, also, you have to appreciate it's a very high bar to yeah. jump. And if there's any alternatives, go for those before you go for paragraph 80. But yes. it's, it's a fantastic thing to get if yes, you do. It, it's the biggest prize. I mean, it, I think rightly it sets a very high bar because it, it would be awful in 10, 20, 30 years time to drive around the English countryside and see these isolated houses mm. and think, well, that's pretty mediocre. Why was that allowed? Yeah, absolutely. We, we want to feel that what we create are, are buildings of beauty that are fantastic family homes and a real contribution to the wider setting and also continue that great yes. um, tradition of the English country house. Absolutely. And, and yes, it is more demanding and therefore more expensive than doing just a replacement dwelling in a village or something mm. like that, but the prize is there to be had. And we both recommend that s approach it on a stage by stage basis. And Francis, on your website, you show examples of your taster days. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've always found actually that people say, oh, it's, it was very expensive to do. But it, what happens is you know very early whether it's not going to get permission. So it isn't a kind of case of, oh, I've invested all this money. You'll know kind of early, you get a no from the planners, mm. fine do you really want to go for this? And then you make a decision, you've got a, whatever, 5% chance of doing it, and then you make a rational decision yeah. whether that's something you want to do. Yeah. So I've never really found that's much of a problem because no. you review it the whole time yeah. as you go through. Yeah. Um, and similarly, if I, if I see a site early on, um, I will you know, discuss the type of house that you think would fit well yeah. there, what the client wants to achieve, but I will also be reviewing very early on is this site capable of... Yeah, and we've been to sites, yeah. and we've just... Several, actually, yeah. and we've just said to the client, nope. bad site, don't yep. do it, don't start, you know, because it's just not worth the investment. Yeah. And other times we go and say, yeah, I yeah. think this can... Do. And sometimes I'm surprised, actually, <laughs> by the ones which, which you... you yeah, no, you I'll, I'll come and see a site, and I can, I can, you know, do a bit of background research as to the change, and I can see the potential for new woodland, new wetland, yeah. enhanced yeah. hedgerows, yeah. species-rich grassland. I know you will design a wonderful house to respond to that setting. Mm. And then, so I say, yes, we have an 80, 90% chance of success. Yes. Why would we fail here yes. if we get it right? And I think yeah. that's what we've been able yeah. to do together. I, I mean, it is on the statue book, books yeah. to be 
uh, to be used. Yeah. It's not. It's not. Um, and we've had a number of successes yes. over the years. Yeah. So yeah. And, and it we does don't happen. Always work together. We both had successes as part of other teams. Yes. Um, but generally, the projects we've done together and with other regular team members and I think having a team who work well together yeah. is, is of paramount importance yeah. and the great thing is when when our firms work together and other landscape architects and colleges we all know what we will deliver we all know how it will gel together yeah. and I can then pull together the documents and the presentation summary in the most cost effective and time efficient way and in an enjoyable way because there's no point in doing this as a client or a professional if you don't enjoy it. No. So I think uh, finally the last thing to say is if you do have uh, a site or maybe several possible sites where you think uh, I, that would be suitable for a country house and that's what you'd like to do, get in touch with either Mia or Martin and we'd come for a day, both of us, and we'd review the different uh, locations and that's how we, we'd start the process. Mm. Mm. So we look forward to being able to do that many more times in the years to come to, to build on the successes that we've had to date. Absolutely.